Even a few years previously, Tiberius Cavano, an Italian scientist, had been experimenting with the idea of inflating soap bubbles with hydrogen gas. It was this that led to the hydrogen balloon. Two years later, Charles, a French chemist, following Cavallo's idea, with the assistance of the Robert brothers, filled small linen and paper bags with hydrogen gas, with alarming results amongst the French peasantry. <laughs> This balloon, built by Charles and Robert in 1784, already embodied the principal features of the modern balloon. A few months later, as the hydrogen balloon superseded the hot air balloon, the sport caught on in England, following several daring flights made by that most picturesque figure in aeronautics, sportsman, soldier, and Neapolitan ambassador to England, Vincent Lunardi. Thank you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, these spheroids or envelopes, having been filled with inflammable air or gas, I now take my seat in the undercarriage or gondola. <laughs> the vast machine is tugging at her ankle. At my signal, she is released and rises majestic to commence her conquest of the air. <laughs> yes, but you're at the mercy of every wind that blows. Uh, no, sir. With the aid of these wings, or pinion, I am able to control, correct or counter it, any adverse trend or current of the breeze. Or oh, wind. With the aid of these wings, I rise into that element, hitherto unvanquished by man, the air or atmosphere. And where does that get you, sir? Sir. It places me completely over the heads of such groundlings as yourself. <laughs> Furthermore, it inaugurates a new epoch or era, the age of flying. Well, no gentleman will dream of driving a coach and four, but will each have his own balloon. In a few years, the sky will be filled with balloons. <laughs> and now, ladies, Who's for a ride to the ceiling with Lunardi, eh? Yeah? Yeah. You will not see the clouds as I did rushing and rolling over one another like the great waves in the tempest, but you will. There is scarcely any higher compliment that you could pay me. <laughs> Then, a year later, ballooning had become as popular in England as on the continent. Sportsmen were seeking new records. The first cross-channel flight to be attempted since Abbott Damien jumped from his wall in Stirling was made from Shakespeare Cliff Dover. The aeronauts were Jean-Pierre Blanchard, a Frenchman, and Dr. John Jeffries of Boston. favoring wind and it appeared they would have an easy success. However, as soon as they reached open water, the balloon began to fall, bringing them uncomfortably close to the sea. The two pioneers not only had to throw overboard their ballast of sandbags, but were compelled to make a start on their clothing. Just as modesty was about to be outraged, a gust of wind lifted the balloon, carrying it across the channel and over the French coastline. So ended another great historic flight. For the first time, the sea had been crossed by air. This flight foreshadowed the day when the channel would no longer be England's invincible defense. Designers now started to evolve a dirigible balloon or airship. Typical of many early attempts is this model with paddles optimistically worked by manpower. 
while this one is an elaboration of the same idea, with an observation car lowered and raised by a winch, a device used a century later by Zeppelins in the Great War. But what is this? A flying Swiss row, a fine achievement, no doubt, but where's his rudder? This bat-like contraption did at least enable its inventor to fall from a considerable height without great damage to himself. Here is an English machine of more comfortable appearance, hopefully designed to resemble a bird, but unfortunately it never rose from the ground. In 1816, Sir George Cayley designed this helicopter, which very closely resembles its modern counterpart. Cayley, known as the father of English aviation, is one of the greatest figures in the history of flying. Here is the very heart of the problem of flight. What do you mean? Look at this screw. When I pull this string, the screw will fly upward. All we have to do is to find a power that will drive it forward. Look at this curling arm. Then you'll understand even that. Cayley had discovered that when a sloping surface was thrust through the air, the pressure of the air would force the plane upwards. It is this resistance which will support the machine in the air. But this much is certain. Hundreds of necks will have to be broken before man can fly. Sir George was evidently so convinced of this that when he tested his glider in 1820, he thought it the better part of valor to have his coachman deputized for him as pilot. Well, up you get. Help him up, lad. Hey, Sir George, it looks very, very nice, but it don't look safe to me. Nonsense, my lad. Come, come, sit down. Nothing can happen to you. Maybe it can't. But I would like to have one foot on the ground. Oh, you'll be all right. The wind will raise you several yards, and you'll sail majestically right across the valley. As you say, it, sir. Come on, boys, push her off. Maybe I will. <laughs> This was the landing of the first successful glide. And wasn't he sensible to choose a river and not the cobblestone so much favored by his predecessors? You've done it! You've done it! Well done! Well done what? You're the first man in history to fly like this. Aye, and as far as I'm concerned, I'll be the last. If you please, Sir George, I was engaged to drive and not to fly. I gives me notice at once. This first pilot didn't wish to rise above his fellow men, and so, in search of a less ambitious existence, he disappeared from the pages of history. Other inventors followed Cayley's lead. Henson and Stringfellow published ambitious designs for a steam-driven aeroplane, and later Stringfellow experimented with steam-driven models along a wire. In Germany in 1860, the boy Otto Lilienthal watched the flight of the birds, as Da Vinci and countless other pioneers had done before him. The keen interest he displayed matured into the scientific study of the problems of flight. In 1889, outside his father's hay barn, he tested the lifting power of various types of wing surfaces. He thinks he's an eagle. I say, eagle, can you lay eggs too? <laughs> Boys, you'll be ashamed someday when you see me fly over your head like a stalk. It was now realized that it was only a matter of years before the air would be finally conquered. In a frenzy of competition, inventors all over the world set to work with renewed vigor. Here is a machine of a strikingly prophetic design. <laughs> 